finite and infinite games, a vision of life as play and possibility by James P. Cox. There are at least two kinds of games. One could be called finite, the other infinite. A finite game is played for the purpose of winning. An infinite game By the way, a good example of finite games are those above ground compost tumblers. You and your finite wisdom have just closed a system to the infinite possibilities from which it sprung. You are playing to win, and spider mites are inevitable. No one can play who is forced to play. It is an invariable principle of all play. Finite. Whoever plays, plays freely. Whoever must play, cannot play. Three, just as it is essential for a finite game to have a definitive ending, it must also have a precise beginning. Therefore, we can speak of finite games as having temporal boundaries, to which, of course, all players must agree. But players must agree to the establishment of spatial and numerical boundaries as well. Spatial boundaries are evident in every finite conflict, from the simplest board and court games to world wars. The opponents in World War II agreed not to bomb Heidelberg and Paris and declared Switzerland outside the boundaries of conflict. When unnecessary and excessive damage is inflicted by one of the sides in warfare, a question arises as to the legitimacy of the victory that side may claim. Even whether it has been war at all and not simply gratuitous, unwarranted violence. When Sherman burned his way from Atlanta to the sea, he so ignored the sense of spatial limitation that for many persons the war was not legitimately won by the Union Army and in fact has never been concluded. Numerical boundaries may take many forms but are always applied in finite games. Persons select what happened before the beginning of the conflict and what would happen after its conclusion. So, also with place and membership, a game is played in that place with those persons. The world is elaborately marked by boundaries of contest, its people finally classified as to their eligibility. Six. In one respect, but only one, an infinite game is identical to a finite game. Of infinite plays, we can also say that if they play, they play freely. If they must play, they cannot.
clear. Otherwise, infinite and finite plays stand in the sharpest possible contrast. Infinite plays cannot say when their game began, nor do they care. They do not care for the reason that their game is not bounded by time. Indeed, the only purpose of the game is to prevent it from coming to an end, to keep everyone in play. There are no spatial or numerical boundaries to an infinite game. No world is marked with the barriers of infinite play, and there is no question of eligibility since anyone who wishes may play an infinite game. While finite games are externally defined, Infinite games are internally defined. The time of an infinite game is not world time, but time created within the play itself. Since each play of an infinite game eliminates boundaries, it opens to play as a new horizon of time. For this reason, it is impossible to say how long an infinite game has been played, or even can be played, since duration can be measured only externally to that which endures. It is also impossible to say in which world an infinite game is played, though there can be any number of worlds within an infinite game. 7. Finite games can be played within an infinite game, but an infinite game cannot be played within a finite game. Infinite players regard their wins and losses in whatever finite games they play, but as moments in continuing play. Finite games must be externally bounded by time, space, and number. They must also have internal limitations on what the players can do to and with each other. To agree on internal limitations is to establish rules of play. The rules will be different for each finite game. It is, in fact, by knowing what the rules are that we know what the game is. What the rules establish is a range of limitations on the players. Each player must, for example, start behind the white line, or have all debts paid by the end of the month, charge patients no more than they can reasonably afford, or drive in the right lane. In the narrowest sense, rules are not laws. They do not mandate specific behavior but only restrain the freedom of the players, allowing considerable room for choice within those restraints. If these restraints are not observed, the outcome of the game is directly threatened. The rules of a finite game are the contractual terms by which the players can agree who has won. 9. The rules must be published prior to play, and the players must agree to them before play begins. A point of great consequence to all finite play follows from this. The agreement of the players to the applicable rules constitutes the ultimate validation of those rules. Rules are not valid because the Senate passed them, or because heroes once played by them, or because God pronounced them through Moses or Muhammad. They are valid only if and when players freely play by them. There are no rules that require us to obey rules. If there were, there would have to be a rule for those rules, and so on. 10. If the rules of a finite game are unique to that game, it is evident that the rules may not change in the course of play, else a different game is being played. It is on this point that we find the most critical distinction between finite and infinite play. The rules of an infinite game must change in the course of play. The rules are changed when the players of an infinite game agree that the play is imperiled by a finite outcome. That is, by the victory of some players and the defeat of others. The rules of an infinite game are changed to prevent anyone from winning the game and to bring as many persons as possible into play. If the rules of a finite game are the contractual terms by which the players can agree who has won, the rules of an infinite game are the contractual terms by which the players agree to continue playing. 
For this reason, the rules of an infinite game have a different status from those of a finite game. They are like the grammar of a living language, where those of a finite game are like the rules of debate. In the former case, we observe rules as a way of continuing discourse with each other. In the latter, we observe rules as a way of bringing the speech of another person to an end. The rules, or grammar, of a living language are always evolving to guarantee the meaningfulness of discourse, while the rules of debate must remain constant. 11. Although the rules of an infinite game may change by agreement at any point in the course of play, it does not follow that any rule will it is not in the sense that the game is infinite. The rules are always designed to deal with specific threats to the continuation of play. Infinite players use the rules to regulate the way they will take the boundaries or limits being forced against their play into the game itself. The rule-making capacity of infinite players is often challenged by the impingement of powerful boundaries against their play, such as physical exhaustion of the of material resources, the hostility of non-players, or death. The task is to design rules that will allow the players to continue the game by taking these limits into play, even when death is one of the limits. It is in this sense that the game is infinite. This is equivalent to saying that no limitation may be imposed against infinite play. Since limits are taken into play, <coughs> play itself cannot be limited. Finite players play within boundaries. Infinite players play with boundaries. Finite speakers come to speech with their voices already trained and rehearsed. They must know what they are doing with the language before they can speak it. Infinite speakers must wait to see what is being done with their language by the listeners before they can know what they have said. Infinite speech does not expect the hearer to see what is already known to the speaker, but to share a vision the speaker could not have had without the response of the listener. Speaker and listener understand each other not because they have the same knowledge about something, and not because they have established a likeness of mind, but because they know how to go. Although it may be evident enough in theory that whoever plays a finite game plays freely, it is often the case that the finite players will be unaware of this absolute freedom and will come to think that whatever they do, they must do. There are several possible reasons for this. We saw that finite players must be selected. While no one is forced to remain a lawyer or a rodeo performer or a kundalini yogi, being selected for these roles. Each role is nonetheless surrounded both by ruled restraints and expectations on the part of others. One senses a compulsion to maintain a certain level of performance, because permission to play in these games can be cancelled. We cannot do whatever we please and remain lawyers or yogis, and yet we could not be either unless we please. Whatever is not done in the interest of winning is not part of the game. The constant attentiveness of finite players to the progress of competition can lead them to believe that every move they make, they must make. It may appear that the prizes for winning are indispensable, that without them life is meaningless, perhaps even impossible. There are, to be sure, games in which the stakes seem to be life and death, and slavery, for example, refusal to play the demanded role may be paid for with terrible suffering or death. Even in this last extreme case, we must still concede that whoever takes up the commanded role does so by choice. Suddenly the price for refusing it is high, but that there is a price at all points to the fact that oppressors themselves acknowledge that even the weakest of their subjects must agree to be oppressed. If the subjects were unresisting puppets or no threat would be necessary, no price would be paid. Thus, the 
satire of the putative ideal of oppressors in Huxley's gamuts, Orwell's proles, and Rossum's universal robots. Unlike infinite play, finite play is limited from without. Like infinite play, those limitations must be chosen by the player since no one is under any necessity to play a finite game. Fields of play simply do not impose themselves on us. Therefore, all the limitations of finite play are self-limitations. Thirteen. To account for the large gap between the actual freedom of finite players to step off the field and play at any time, and the experienced necessity to stay at the struggle, we can say that as finite players, we somehow veil this freedom from ourselves. Some self-failing is present in all finite games. woman in her acting be unaware that she is acting. She never forgets that she has failed herself sufficiently to play this role, but she has chosen to forget for the moment that she is this woman and not to fail. But then, neither do we as audience forget. We are audience. Even though we see this woman as a failure, we are never in doubt that she is not. We are in complicity with her veil. We allow her performed emotions to affect Of one role for another, say, 